Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. For your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals and whatever it is that we have decided, decided to talk about this evening, we're going to be talking about wisdom wear with my guest, Aaron Joyner. I met Aaron some time ago at the local health club where we both work out, and we started talking about stuff that I've been trying for ages to have him come on the show and talk about what he's about, and finally I got him here. <laughs> finally. How are you feeling? Excellent. How about you? I'm a little nervous, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm okay, yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a good hour we'll have together. I'm sure it will. And as you know, the show goes first uh, half hour, 20 minutes or so, we'll talk about who you are personally, and then we'll talk about wisdom wear and your adventures in, in that area and how important that has been uh, for you. Mm -hmm. So let's start off with uh, the who you are segment, and I will do a bit of a model. And nobody's asking me these questions, but I'll answer them as though someone has asked me. And it's kind of a monologue, so bear with me as I read this from my cheat sheet here. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, of red, white, and black Roman Catholic parentage on December 26, 1928. Today I am a-religious and accepting of all others. I am a retired Ph.D. clinical psychologist and present-day television broadcast journalist. I am the twelfth of twelve children and married and am the father of five daughters by first marriage. Politically, I am a progressive populist activist, still learning how to live lovingly. That's hard to say, progressive populist activist. A few of my heroes include Jesus, Gandhi, MLK, and any other fellow human being who is currently living lovingly. So that's a brief overview. Uh, I pretend, pre pretended that you asked me all those questions. <laughs> now it's your turn. Shall I start by asking you a question? Sure, that would probably be better. All right. <laughs> I'm usually not very, very good about just on and on and on and on and on and on. No one is, yeah. Uh, if I were to ask your best friend, who is Aaron? What would your best friend say? Aaron is, be the first person. Aaron is what? Is who? Uh, they would probably say no, that. Don't say they, uh, oh. they would say Aaron is. Aaron is one of the most positive thinking people out there. Interesting. One I've, of the most positive thinking people out there. Right. Okay, anything else they would say or shall we go on? What else would they say? He just doesn't know when to give up. <laughs> I love that. He just doesn't know when to, I love that, yeah. Actually, my wife has told me that. <laughs> <laughs> In a good sense. In a good sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, when and where were you born? Eugene, Oregon, 1955. Oregonian, 1955. Yeah. Yeah. Anything uh, significant about your racial, national, or cultural heritage worth uh, telling our viewers about? You know, that's an interesting question. I hope so. Anything interesting mm -hmm. about your, your racial, National or cultural heritage, any or all of the above? Probably one of the main things I would say about that is I'm glad that I was born in 1955 in Eugene, Oregon. Why would you say that? Because a lot of the uh, racism type stuff yeah. had already passed pretty much. Yeah. I didn't really, I pretty much, uh, this kind of ties into what we were sharing before. Mm -hmm is it was more or less I grew up as a white person. Uh-huh, interesting. Meaning, in Eugene, Oregon at that time, there weren't very many, whatever you want to call them, African Americans, black, Negro, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, who cares? <laughs> uh, is bec you know, there weren't that many there. Uh -huh. So most of the, probably 95% of the people that I was uh, socialized with, uh -huh. or even went to school with, neighborhood, whichever, were Caucasian. Uh -huh. 
you know, it, it, you know, it, it brings a different meaning to minority because people were always fascinated with us. Well, you know, they wanted to touch our hair because it feels funny. <laughs> yeah. Or, or the uh, joke uh, when, the, when there's a substitute teacher, when he's trying to get, he or she was trying to get our attention, uh, he would put a coin. That was back in the days where you actually used coins. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of credit cards. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he would put one of those in our hair and wanted us, to, I don't really, really, really remember the total story, but anyway, the coin was not really visible in our hair. Yes. Uh-huh. Back in those days, because that's when we had the big froze, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. The Cornell West deal <laughs> <Right. laughs> It's interesting how that kind of has kind of changed. Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. I'm older than you, and I remember things were different in New oh, Orleans yeah. where I grew up. Oh, yeah. And we could have stories about that, you and I. And by the way, a, a brief aside here, I'm so glad to have you on because yeah. I have such a hard time getting black people. Really? Be guests, yeah. Well, okay. Okay, so do you and I together. Do, do you know many? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's the problem, see? Especially how I grew up in this third culture in New Orleans, the, the white and the colored, and then the Creoles. Mm-hmm. And the Creoles thought they were one step uh, above the colored, and the white people saw us as all colored. Mm-hmm. And it kind of confused little kids like me wanting to be something other than black or African American. Mm-hmm. took a long time to grow through that, and still I have occasional ch- indications where I'm seeing, thinking that I am better than somebody who is darker skinned than I am, the brown paper bag thing. Oh, I got stories we, we can go on forever and ever. Sometime in the gym between mm-hmm. workouts, we'll share some of those things about what right. it was like for me being black or African American uh, in Louisiana in uh, in the 30s. Yeah, but anyhow, you have a religious preference. Christian. Uh huh. Small C, big C. I say that because small C means Christian for me. Uh, because of what Christ was about and how he lived his life caring for fellow human beings right. rather than big C like a Christian church or a Christian denomination or Catholic or Protestant like that. That's a difference for me. Probably the first one. Yeah. Okay. Because cr- Christianity is not in the church. Okay. How, how else are people go- go- going to know how Christ live if they're all hidden church? People need to see the real deal. Uh huh. People need to see the real. Well, deal. Well, the real the real deal is you know in, anyone can can go to church, but then not everyone can live it. That's uh-huh. what people are looking for. They're looking for, and that's the reason I choose the word the real deal, is because we've heard all the things on television of this and that happened and all that. Well, we find out that they're probably not any better than anyone else. So why go to church? <laughs> <laughs> And of course, if, if, if there are any, any ministers or, you know, th- th- this kind of thing listening, they say, you know, that fellow, he probably has some truth there. Is because people need to know how to live the life. Yeah. Do you know how to live the life? I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> how far along are you and you're working on it? Until I die. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like that. Well, because no, no one has arrived. I don't, I don't know of any that, it's, that it has arrived, so mm-hmm. why not make it a journey? And it's not so much the destination, it's the trip along the way, huh? Right, pretty much. Yeah. Did you have a formal religion as a youngster? I did. Mm-hmm. What was that? We went to a Baptist church. Mm-hmm. And you got to be a Christian with a small C at some point in time. Did you give up uh, bap- uh, being a Baptist? Or are you still a Baptist? I'm a believer of Christ. Uh, uh-huh. I'm, not, I'm not necessarily a Baptist. I'm not necessarily a this or that. I'm who God made me to be. Uh-huh. That's the key. Okay. Because we can get so stuck in 
what we call religion, we f lose the flavor, I uh -huh. think, if that makes sense. Kind of. Yeah. You want to say some more about it? I shall well, we move on. Well, in other words, if we, tried, if we try to do all these rules and regulations, which no one, else, no one can really do on a long-term basis, it's almost useless. Well, it is useless because no, no one is perfect. Gets to be kind of boring too, doesn't it? Probably so. Yeah. And your formal education. Mm -hmm. You got some of that? Formal education, uh, you know, uh, high school, college, took some uh, college classes, that sort of thing. Did, did not get an actual degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to get a degree in business, but that just didn't seem to work out. Mm -hmm. You know, it really makes it really difficult <clears throat> um, being legally blind with about 12% eyesight. You have about 12% eyesight? Pretty You're much. Legally yes. blind? Legally blind, yeah. And you can still drive? No. Okay, someone brought you here. Right. Okay. And how long have you been that way? Since birth. Since birth? Mm -hmm. My gosh. So you probably have some interesting observations for people who are sighted who would care to listen to you. That's kind of how that kind of ties into what we're going to, we're here for. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll save that for the second half. We'll save the less, best for last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm, so, I'm somewhat of a comedian. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> How about other education other than your, uh, your college stuff? Formal? Informal or whatever that comes under the category of education. There's formal education and, and other education. There's some people say uh, I got more education in the School of Hard Knocks, for example. Uh, any, any other? Other than School of Hard Knocks? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes something comes to mind, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I do a lot of reading, um, which gives me education. Mm -hmm. Also, being as old as I am, that gives you ed education as well. But I'm constantly learning, constantly trying to do different things. You know, I'm not necessarily stuck in a box, so to speak. I'm whatever the occasion calls for. And in, in numbers, how old are you? Besides 21 is what I usually tell people. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore him out there. <laughs> yeah. 59. 59. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You're looking forward to retirement or not? I'm not sure if I'm really ever going to retire. <laughs> <laughs> you like your work? I enjoy it. I love it. Uh-huh. All right. You know, the main thing that I love is the people. Because it's it's interesting to talk with various type of people. A lot of what I do is on the phone. Mm -hmm. And I don't sound African American mm -hmm. or the in the traditional sense. Sure. So when people it's kind of I, I make a game of it almost. If I've communicated with someone for let's say for about a year and then we'll, we'll get a chance to meet and I'll go into their, their business operation and in, introduce myself. Hi, my name is Aaron Joyner. You can see the, sounds like Aaron Joyner. Must be Aaron Joyner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because sometimes people, people. <laughs> You're calling back memories for me, Aaron. God darn it. <laughs> you know, it's fun. It is. You know, to yeah. uh, just relate to different people. You know, whether they're young, whether they're old, makes no difference. They're still a person. And to me, that's what's important. When I was smiling so big just now about what thought came to mind, uh, many years ago I was an aircraft mechanic and, and uh, working in the aircraft industry. And... Uh, I was a little smaller than the average bear, so I was pretty bright, and I got mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lot of things and promotions early on. And 
the company, North American Aviation at the time, was looking for field service representatives to go overseas to the Air Force bases and talk to the airmen about the airplanes that we were delivering to them, that they mm -hmm. were taking care of. And uh, they went through the records and they found that in my testing for certain pr promotions on, uh, as a mechanic, uh, I had the highest score and was way up there. So they sought me out to become a field service representative. Mm -hmm. And when I went into that uh, division, that department, and the people I had to go through to get to the guy in charge of this big division, yeah, they saw me and they, they looked kind of funny. They couldn't under understand it. Then finally, the guy I got to see, you know where I'm going with this. Because my records show I was brighter, and no, no black guy could be that smart. <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> but I learned to convert a liability into an asset. Right. Because when they saw me, they threw them all off base, they don't know what the hell was going on. And when they got to experience me in person and see that I am as, as bright as my records show, then they're listening to me. They're paying more attention mm -hmm. to me because I'm an exception, something they're not used to seeing. Mm -hmm. But it isn't always that way. Sometimes oh, yeah. it's the other way around. And my experience as a child has been probably different than yours. And we're both African American or black mm -hmm. with varying mysteries involved. Mm -hmm. So that was my, what my laugh was about when you said Well, I, I thought that there was something there. You know, uh, my, my, you, didn't, you didn't ask about my parents and this and that. But my parents were, um, they lived in, I would say, I guess, grew up in the South. Mm -hmm. You know, Palestine, Texas, Houston, Texas. Oh, yeah. My dad's parents were born in 1918 and 1917. Mm -hmm. So they had seen a lot of prejudice and a lot of that sort of thing. And I, my father always used to tell us, you don't know what prejudice is. Yeah. Now they hide it now, but back then they didn't. Right. And, and, and you know, and that's not, not to be a put down and th this and that. Times change. It's a reality. Yeah. How it was. That's then. the reason that I shared... I'm thankful that I was born in 1950. I'm up nine, almost almost said 1918. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels that way. <laughs> I'm thankful that I was born in that in that those years 1955 in Eugene, Oregon, mm -hmm. in a small town, mm -hmm. and basically uh, being that our parents grew up in the South, my father wanted to and this re, you didn't really answer the, ask this but go ahead n no charge <laughs> <laughs> uh, he wanted things better for his family so at one point of our time we lived down around a lot of uh, black people in Eugene Oregon believe it or not there was probably 20 families or so mm -hmm. it seemed like they had all congregated in about the same area right where the Eugene, Eugene Hotel is sitting today. Uh -huh. They tore all that down, put, put the Eugene Hotel there, as far as, you know, th th there were houses there. And um, they, uh, my father had said, we're going to move on the other side of town, similar to Beaverton or Hillsboro or something like that, to, to, where, to where there wasn't so much population of black people. Sure. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I made the, the statement, I might be a black man on the outside, but I'm a white man on the inside, is because it doesn't really, what's the point? You know, for instance, we, we have a 26-year-old son who got out of college maybe three years ago, has a job talking to another African-American person. Oh, we need to hear more about the old days. And my comeback was, why? What's it going to do for you? Is it going to give you a better job? Is it going to give you better uh, education? Nope. I said, you need to live for the day. Not, to, not that we don't need to know what, our, what our, our background is, our culture and this and that, but all that is going to get us nowhere. Mm -hmm. Today is the day. For me, it's important to, uh, on that reality, 
that we're talking about now, what it was like in my time compared mm. to your time. And when it's appropriate, when it's useful to recall those times, mm -hmm. uh, probably to support my kid have a, having experienced some degree of that sort of mistreatment mm -hmm. to let them know they're not alone, that it isn't new. So I, I don't want to forget about the past totally, right. and I don't want to dwell on it. Uh, oh, I have stories. Sometimes... You should write a book. I have the outline sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> I started, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, and, and I enjoy relating those kinds of stories to people like you, for example, because I don't meet many people like you up here mm -hmm. in Beaverton, where I live, you know. And uh, let's not go any further with that one there. Talking about parents, mm -hmm. Mama and Papa were uh, red, white, and black racially. I, I arbitrarily say a third, a third, and a third, mm -hmm. you know, because my oldest daughter tracks this stuff crazily, like the heritage and that kind of stuff and genealogy. And mm -hmm. For me, I, I listen to her, but I don't follow it too closely because there were a lot of woodpiles back in those days right. and all sorts of things were going on. But uh, you have brothers and sisters. One brother, one sister. Mm. And where are they? My sister lives in Hillsboro. Mm -hmm. And I have a brother that lives in California. Mm -hmm. Do they see the racial thing like you do? I think my sister does. Now, this is a different slant. Sure. My brother, who lives in California, is not comfortable under his own skin. What do you mean by that? He doesn't feel comfortable being a black man. Oh. Give me an example of, 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 of... I'm only repeating what he shared. <laughs> that's, that's what he said. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Do you know what he meant by that? I'm only taking a stab at this, but... Of course. Of being course. that he lives in California, you have a lot of... Call it diversity. Yeah. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. Is he light-skinned enough where he can pass for white? No. Okay. In my family, it was kind of funny like that because we have some blood relatives who are, are white and they, they moved on and they became white in the eyes of the population because they were light-skinned enough. Mm -hmm. And that, a lot of that uh, mixed relationships went on in the, in the past century and even mm -hmm. the century before that. But uh, I'm digressing too far. Well, I have a, had a grandfather who could have passed as a white man. Yeah. And he had sandy curly hair mm -hmm. and people I'm only repeating what, what I heard when I was a kid because I think the information that we get when we are a kid is totally different than when we become an adult Sure, we just perceive things different but I re what I remember my mother saying was he could have they tried to talk him into be, to passing off as a white man yeah he just wouldn't do it yeah. Oh, we got some stories. We can go too long on that one. Let's just keep going, okay? Okay. <laughs> uh, children. Uh, uh, is a question about your political political persuasion appropriate now? Are you left, right, center, or, or what? I'm in between. In between. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew it was coming. <laughs> Yeah, uh, memberships in political, social, or civic organizations. You, you hold any memberships in, in any of those kinds of organizations that would be of interest to the viewers. I'm a member of uh, uh, NAACP, the ACLU, the Humanist of Greater Portland, Common Cause, Public Citizen, and uh, uh, many more. I'm a, a I'm not, I'm, I don't have any. junkie, a political leftist, and like, like that. So please go on. I, I, I'm, I'm not, a, not a member of any of them. Oh. Yeah. Mm, no membership. You're a lone wolf, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, the whole thing just seems so complicated. You mm -hmm. know, especially when, you, when, you, when it comes time to vote. It seems like things just counteract themselves. <laughs> you know, for instance, if you were... Uh, 
let's say you, 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 didn't, you didn't agree with abortion. Okay, so you check, check off, you didn't agree with abortion, but it affects something else. So how does all this work? Good question. Yeah. That's the reason I say complicated. Yes. <laughs> I think it's important that for an individual to live responsibly and socially responsible, to sort through enough of this stuff to have some influence, how, however minimal it might be. Because I say sometimes in my, my political arguments, the discussions, uh, don't tell me about it's impossible to do anything about it because you're just one person. Well, I go back to uh, civil rights and the Vietnam War and Martin Luther King's work and women's suffrage, and it was only one or two in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And they kept at it and kept at it. So when there's injustice abroad somewhere, locally or nationally or internationally, then I'm obliged to speak up. That's why I wear my signs all the time. Uh, personally, I, I... Tell them about your signs. <laughs> or do, 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 do they know about your signs? Yes, they do. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Okay. The whole world knows about my signs. My latest one, I should have brought it in. I, I do have it in the control room. And it's, a, it's a, a little more blunt than mine usually are. It's two-sided. One side has uh, Zionists uh, need a new home uh, outside of Palestine and Shell is looking for it in there. And the other side says, Zionism sucks. Uh, tender, loving care uh, is, gets a thumbs up, something like that. So I have a, a good time. Don't talk about my signs anymore. I'll go on forever <laughs> and ever. <laughs> and persons from the past are alive today that you look up to, uh, up, feel, uh, good, feel good about knowing. Any names come to mind? You know what mine or you've seen my people, sign. People that are alive today. You see the sign? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Scientists need a new home away. Away from Palestine. What do you think of that? Yeah. That's one of your signs. That's one of them. The other side is uh oh, I'm gonna get in trouble with this one. Judaism or Jews don't suck, Zionists suck. So because they don't want the uh, Palestinians to have their homeland. Now, I, I don't wanna get on my soapbox, that's enough for me. We're talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> so any names come to mind of anybody you admire? other than Jesus and Martin Luther King and Gandhi? No one comes to my mind right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, the person that I think, think about uh, fairly often was my father. Really now? Yeah. Why is that? Because he was a person that I looked up to and other people looked up to him. Not that he was perfect. Sure. But you know, your father is always your father. But why did, why did people look up to him? Why did you look up to him, personally for you? You know, because he, he tried to help people. He did? No matter what. You know, for instance, um, we're just shooting from the hip here. Sure. Is, uh, for instance, in, in, back in those days, we, we had a lot of door-to-door -door salesmen, right? Yeah. Knocking on the doors, you know, pushing this, pushing that. Oh, yeah. You know, come on in. He give him his chair. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear it. But, you know, he always want, even the, he wasn't really very well educated. Yeah. But if he could help someone, why not? He was a good, a good man, yeah. a nice man. Yeah. And I don't use that word. Uh, uh, without thinking about when they're saying somebody's nice. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my mom and dad, I think, Papa and Mama, we used to call them mm -hmm. back in those days. I'm not sure w which one went to third grade and one, which one went to fifth grade. But that's all the formal education they had. So things, 
should change from generation to generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how do you see the mainstream, mainstream media in America? Is it left, right, or center, or all over the place, or what, generally speaking? Hmm. And you don't have to answer? It's mixed. Of course it is. Generally speaking? Generally speaking. All right. You know, in it, it's mixed up, mm -hmm. really. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, we have a lot of diversity here. We have a lot of ideas, some of, some right, some wrong. Okay. And we don't take a break. Uh, somebody's going to yell at me, so we better take a break. Mr. Director, and you too, John. Anywhere between 6.30 to 7.00. Uh, so be aware that uh, someone will be out here to pick up our guest about 6.30 or so. So hold their hand and have them hold tight till we're done, okay? You know, so we're back. Thanks for staying tuned. And for your viewers who missed the opening, opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don that you're watching is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there and like my guest here, Aaron, about who they are as unique one of a kind individuals, and I'm really enjoying talking to you so much so far, and about whatever it is we've decided to talk about tonight. And now we're going to talk about uh, wisdomware, adaptive technology. Mm -hmm. Why don't you start, and then I'll ask you some questions. Well, adaptive technology is technology via computer. Technology via computer. What uh, in heaven's uh, days does that for, mean? For people that have dis severe disabilities. Severe disabilities? Describe what that means. Uh, severe, disabilities. Sur severe disabilities, let's say they're totally blind. Uh -huh. Or they're legally blind with about 12% eyesight. Or they're paraplegic, quadriplegic, uh, learning disabilities, that sort of thing. A whole range, huh? Yeah. So, uh, starting with probably the hardest, or one, one of the hardest, is a, a person that's totally blind. If you ask them to do something on a computer, and you hand them the mouse, and they say, what do I do with this? He or she can't see it. Of course. There's no voice, there's nothing. So. I work with uh, maybe about 10 or 12 companies that have developed soft p different pieces of softwares and hardwares to b for a person to work to use work with to use a computer. F for example, one of the uh, programs um, could I m mention the name? Yes, it's okay. for, for okay. a good okay cause. The uh, name. <laughs> What, one of the uh, pieces of software are, it's called Wiz Window Eyes. Uh -huh. So basically, after this software is installed on a computer, working with the sound card, mm -hmm. if you push the Windows key, it'll say Windows key, mm -hmm. it, with a synthetic voice. Mm -hmm. If you go to an email and use the command, the keystroke, it'll read everything. Or let's say that you want to uh, have this person um, do some word processing. Mm -hmm. He or she can type, 
it'll if you push the letter A, it'll say A. Um, there you go. Just from memory and knowing where the keys well, are. Well, yeah, uh, touch, it, touch typing. Yes. Now, I've known of some totally blind person, pe persons, people that could out-type most is because they're not concentrating on looking at the monitor. They're concentrating on probably two different things. One of the things is they're concentrating on typing and what it is that they want to have typed, and it's done by touch. Uh, I, I've given different presentations to, let's say, like the Beaverton Library, or I shouldn't say Beaverton Library, but anyway. That's, uh, a, that's uh, or, okay, because okay. It's, a, it's a good cause, right. bottom right. line, right. so it's well, okay. Well, you know, this was to a presentation to the local librarians, the managers, and I said, let me turn, before we get started, let's turn the monitor off to give them an idea of what is it like to use a computer without a monitor. Mm. To most people, that's the guts of the computer. They just couldn't function without seeing, seeing something. And, and so after we did this for, for about less than, less than one minute, they said, could you turn it back on? We need to know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, they, but they were, they somehow blacked out the sound because they were concentrating on visual. Yes. So a person could very easily, if, if one learned 10 keystrokes, and by the way, when Microsoft or even Apple mm -hmm. uh, developed computers or software, they used keystrokes. These are, these are not keystrokes that I made up or um, s special uh, programmers made. They were, they were already there. Yes. So that's the reason why we call it adaptive technology, because we're adapting to something that's already there, or to a paraplegic who cannot physically use a, key a keyboard. It could all be done via voice. Really? Yeah, you'd say, click Windows key. Voila, there it is on the monitor. It'll do what, what the Windows key would do. And you work with all sorts of handicaps. Mm -hmm. Boy, I bet you've got some stories. Oh, I do. But you know, it's very interesting to where if I'm talking to the, on a phone with someone, we'll just have a conversation. We, we, we may not even talk about technology. That's what's fun about it. <laughs> you know, we may not get around to talking about technology because being that I am legally blind, uh -huh. there's an automatic connection. They're not concerned about, does this person really understand what I'm talking about? Or if you go to one of the local uh, retail stores to buy a computer, let's say Office Depot, and you say, I would like to look at some computers, what do, you, what, what do you have in, in, in the way of uh, adaptive technology? Well, they, they'd have to look, look up that, that term on their smartphone. Sure. Adaptive technology, what, what, what is that? They, they just don't know, so they really can't, can't steer a person in the right direction. That's what I do. And places like Office Depot and those kinds of stores have that kind of software? They don't. And that's where you come in. Right. Uh, is it spreading, uh, getting bigger, or staying steady, or is the government not putting enough funding? It's, lo it's a losing. <laughs> oh, it's man. losing. For instance, one of the, the weaknesses, and the, to everything there's a weakness, right? Sure. One of the weaknesses is price. Some of these people for the program that I'm referring to called Window Eyes, thousand bucks. One piece of software. Okay. Or if you're talking about a program called Zoom Text, which magnifies everything with voice, 600 bucks. Now, most, if you know anything about disabled people, they don't have any money. No. Not, not really. I mean, sure, they have a few bucks maybe stored up or this sort of thing. So one of the companies 
well, the, the company called Window Eyes, and this just happened recently, relatively about three months ago. You see, when I first started this company, I had heard it's all going to be integrated. Really? Meaning a person like myself wouldn't have to go out and spend a, twice the amount of money for a computer. It's all going to be within the operating system. Yeah. So what has happened recently with Microsoft and GW Micro, the people that make window eyes, they have made it avail available to as long as you have Office 10, you can download that program for free. For free? You remember that old saying, or I'm not sure if you were here, Tom Peterson's? He would always say, free is a very good price. <laughs> <laughs> and free is not always a good price, but in this case, it is a good price. How did you get Microsoft to go along with that uh, sort of a thing? I per, I'm not that intelligent. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's something that they did. What we are finding is that companies, in order, in order to stay afloat with the economy, they're merging together. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe 10 years ago, three of the main players in this field merged together. I personally thought they were crazy. Is because how is this going to work? But they're still th some of the big main players in this industry. Is it a competition or is it uh, a, a need to do good and to care for fellow human beings that uh, causing them to do what you just mentioned Microsoft is going to have in Windows 10? this huge improvement that's going to be considerate of people with handicaps? I think it's both. I think it's, I think it's profit first and then doing good. Uh, because okay. that's, how, that's how we're taught. Most people are taught, if you're going to go into business, you must be profitable. Well, Jesus didn't think about that. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, he could create money. <laughs> money, no problem. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, Jesus could create money. He could create money. Well, remember the loaves. Okay. You know they. Oh, let's let's feed the people. Well, we don't have any anything. No problem. Bring it over here, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll hook you up. <laughs> there you go. All of a sudden, you're feeding all these people. So that was a story in, uh, uh, written about in the Bible, but there must have been some sort of behavior that would lend itself to creating this sort of a, f of a fantasy to have people realize that we should care for our fellow humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, parables and those kinds of stories. It's just, Back in those days, humans went overboard sometimes and got too far out where we can't make sense about putting all those darn animals on the ark and where you're going to put the waste. <laughs> that was meant to be funny. Don't laugh. Okay. <laughs> put, put, put the waste, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of animals. Yeah. But there must have been some thing going on that would lend itself to creating these kinds of fables that would stand in good stead for people to have uh, things to live according to. Uh, how'd you get started? How did I get started? Yeah. You gave me these questions. Don't repeat the questions back to me. <laughs> you started it, Aaron. <laughs> you know, um, when I was 38, I worked for a uh, mortgage company, mm. and this is during the, the refi boom going downhill. Mm. I needed to do something else different. I knew that it was time for me to go. Sure. So I decided, okay, why not upgrade your education? It would probably be a good idea. Most of, most of the people in my family are educated. You know, our, our kids are educated, 
they all have degrees except for one. Mm -hmm. um, so during this process, I went through all the proper channels, uh, the Commission for the Blind, you know, to where they refer this and refer that. And I, I said, I, I need to get a computer. I, f I found out about adaptive technology. And so I, they work off of a list. You know, the state has to have three bids for pretty much everything. So they, they gave me this list. And I kept on calling the vendors, and one person returned the phone call. He's the one that got the business. <laughs> uh -huh. So he came over, and he showed me this, showed me that, and I said, okay, I want this, 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 this. 5000 bucks, accumulatively. Okay, it'll take about two, maybe ten days to get it and all this. Got it. He came over, installed it. He showed me a few things, sure. But then after he left, now what do I do? I don't know how to use this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, know, you, th you think that, that, that you, you could memorize what, what, what one had showed you, but in, so anyway, I, excuse me. Well, the internal process has to learn. Mm -hmm. Even though you're, you're not using uh, one of your major uh, senses, mm -hmm. So he showed me how to do all those things. You know, that was back when one scanner cost you 700 bucks. How things change as time goes one by. One monitor. Of course, I had to have the top of the line. You would. <laughs> <laughs> A 21-inch monitor. Uh-huh. 2,000 bucks. At that time, yeah. At that time. So things have changed. And, you know, that monitor being on all the time for 10 years... 10, or t 10 to 13 years lasted that long. Unlike the monitors that we have today, <laughs> need I say more on that one? Yeah. So yeah. anyway, you, you get what you pay for. So, so anyway, uh, after spending the money and calling him and trying to call him, would not return phone calls. Mm, that doesn't sound very good to me. So I called the Commission for the Blind and I said, I need some help. This person's not returning phone calls. Well, you didn't get it through us, so you're on your own, buddy. Okay. That doesn't sound very good. No. But we will give you one hour's worth of training. I'll take it. I went there, showed me a few things. Back in those days, you didn't have a manual in your software, in your help file. Sure. You had the books that thick. <laughs> so, being that I had a scanner, being that I had a manual, scan the book, read the book, voila. Do this, do that. Call the technical people. Learn that way. Here we are. Tenacious. Well, after about a year of reading and trying this and trying that, you know, that was back when when, when computers weren't as good as they are today. <laughs> you know, there, there, there were bugs. We got five or six minutes left. For, okay, for five time. or six minutes. So, okay, so uh, taught myself basically, and I decided this would be a good opportunity for me. Helping people, in other words, turning a disability into an ability. Okay. That. So I went into business. What has that done for you internally? What you just talked about, how you decided to help yourself and be assertive mm -hmm. and take charge and make something happen rather than say, I'm blind, there's nothing mm -hmm. I can do. What has that done for you internally? Quite, quite honestly, I, wasn't, I didn't grow up that way. <laughs> One of the things my father always used to tell me, being that he wasn't very well educated, but yet a smart man at the same time. Sure. The thought process was anything you want to do, you can do. It was not allowed, at least I don't remember hearing in our household, I can't find a way. 
that. That's uh, what he gave you. That's what that's that's what he gave me. So saying that I can't, even though it takes me fifty times long as to do most things, that's what my wife says. <laughs> she says, Why does it take you so long to do everything? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if I want her to see this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hey, look funny. at that camera and tell her what you want to tell her right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, so you talked a little about how adaptive technology has affected your life. Has it turned out as, as you hoped it would, adaptive technology? No. Adaptive technology, being that this is considered to be a niche business. Yes. I'm going to say this in layman terms. It ain't easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, yet you're doing it. Well, even when I first started or wanted to start, I thought, okay, the best way, the best uh, way to start a business is to work for a company doing the same thing. Sure. That would probably be a smart thing to do. Well, so I called around to some of the main vendors, and one of the people, he, I came over to his office, and I told him about my experience, business experience. Mm -hmm. mm, there's some hesitancy there. I'm not sure if we want to just open up the front door for you, <laughs> because you might take some business away from us. Mm. And then one of the other main vendors would not return phone calls after we'd had a conversation. I said, I see the writing on the wall here. I need to go in business for myself. There you go. And how long have you been in business for yourself? Probably about 18 years. 18 years. Yeah. And it pays a few nickels. Sometimes. <laughs> what are you doing to me? <laughs> this one, I think I got you all figured out. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's being the way that the economy has panned out, so to speak, uh -huh. it is really rough. Yes. You know, uh, people ask all the time, has the economy affected your business? Affected your business? Mm -hmm. I says, you know, to be totally honest with you, even when the economy wasn't good, it affected the business because schools are saying we don't have any money, which I don't believe them, by the way. Uh, you know, uh, the, the library, well, anyway, they're just saying, they're just saying, <laughs> saying that we don't, we don't have any money and it's not a priority. The people that need this equipment is... Marginal, mm -hmm. not that important. Ah, mm -hmm. where do you think this type of technology is, go is going to, to go in the next five to ten years? Five to ten years? I didn't think about some of these questions when I put them on the paper. I can <laughs> tell. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> five to ten years? You know, I think that computers are going to be the size of a cell phone. Really? Mm hmm Wow. I think I saw some, uh, an article one time to where a person that had a headset on, and somehow they were using a computer, the si pretty, mm, let's say, a, twice the size of a cell phone, of, of a smartphone. That's hard to believe, but considering my first cell phone I had was like a brick. <laughs> And I paid twenty some hundred dollars for it because mm -hmm. I wanted to be up there. I was a practicing psychologist at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to think about what's going to be happening five or ten years from now in technology. But I think it's going to be all pretty much voice activated. Oh man! For instance, for those that have smartphones, you could push the home button and say, "Tell me what time it is." You have a voice that says, it'll tell you what time it is. You could say, what's the distance or spelling or whatever. I, 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 I use mine as a dictionary sometimes. 
<laughs> what is the meaning of I love Google. Z this and that, and you know? Wikipedia. Yeah. Listen, time is running out. They're going to yell at me if we don't wind down. Okay. Uh, you have a final thought or message to say, to give to the viewers out there about uh, what's happened here or anything else that comes to mind right now as a final message from you to my viewers. Don't give up. Whatever your goals, whatever your dream is, don't give up. That's, that's, that's got to be it. Yeah. I agree, and I will never give up. <laughs> <laughs> and you're reinforcing it to see what you're doing, what you've done with your life, considering the obstacles you had to deal with, the fact that you're uh, legally blind, mm -hmm. and the fact that you're not white, and uh, the fact that you've got this delightful personality. <laughs> so thank you for thank coming you. on the show. Public service announcements to Mr. E and you too, Sean. Ah, you get my local broadcast schedule, go to my website, www.donbayam.com, and click on Present Day Activities. Next, to watch my shows on the web, go to Don Bayam YouTube, click on a particular show. There's many shows on there and a whole variety of shows, so click on and see what's going on with my shows. To learn, to learn more about the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, go to the website, www.aclu.org. Without the ACLU, our civil liberties would be further in the tube than they are right now. And to get my shows broadcast by other stations at your local public access station, go to www.pegmedia.org and follow instructions there so that that local station and other parts of the country can get these shows. To end corporate personhood, personhood which we've got to do to get the money out of the political process, and to say that corporations are not persons. Thanks for watching. Remember KFC? Not that KFC, Dr. Don's KFC. Kind, friendly, <laughs> and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable to you too. And you too, Aaron. And you too, Sean. <laughs> and you too, Kat. And you too, Bonobo, and you too, Mystery. Thanks again for watching. Good night.